Hello, welcome to The Horticulturalists. I am Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan. And we post a video every week. So why not press subscribe and alert to keep up to date with what our adventures are. And if you've got a burning horticultural question for Stephen Ryan, put it in the comments below with where you're from and you, not I, will answer it in 60 seconds. And that happens every Monday, so come on board. Yes. But Stephen, I am sensing a different environment today. Yes, we're not actually in my garden, no. but we're in my neighbour's garden. I was going to say, we're not that far, but I can almost yeah. see your yeah, garden Yeah, it's only there. two doors up. So we're at my neighbour's garden, Cathy Newing, who is a, a long-time friend. We've mm. known each other for probably 30 years or more. And Cathy's a very enthusiastic horticulturalist and a great plants woman. And she has a remarkable collection of plants in her garden. Yes. And we came here to visit her lilacs, and we've suddenly found a new story. So so yes. there you go. And what it is, is actually right behind us. Well, we'll reveal now what the story is. It's essentially a woodland walk, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Kathy's got a quite narrow section on the more or less blind side of her house mm. uh, that she has developed as a little miniature woodland, which could fit into almost any sized garden. Yeah. Uh, so it shows you how you can use those sort of almost blind spaces around mm. a garden to turn it into something valuable, important, and attractive. So we're going to look at Kathy's beautiful woodland garden, talk about the principles of creating a woodland garden in quite a tight urban space mm. and the type of plants you can use and the type of plants that Kathy's got and walk through it. Yes, exactly. Yes. And hopefully you'll all get inspiration for your own gardens. You from will. It. So let's go, Stephen. All right, right, let's. All right, Stephen. So let's first of all just look at the principles of a woodland garden. Yes. So what are the things you've got to bear in mind if you want to create one? All right, well, you've got to have an over canopy, of course. Yes. And Kathy's used a couple of different types of trees to give her that shady canopy that yeah. she wants. Yeah. And because it's a comparatively restricted space, yeah. she's used things that don't grow too broadly spready. Yes. Because otherwise she might annoy the neighbours or whatever, or it will grow over her roof and be a damn nuisance. Yes. So, so she's put in an over canopy of trees and basically what she's used is two main species. Yeah. One is the classical silver birch yeah. uh, because of its upright habit yeah. and the other is the Chinese five-finger maple, yeah. Acer pentaphyllum, which has the beautiful fine foliage that is useful over a, a woodland garden because you don't want a really heavy canopy. You want something that cuts up the light yeah. and also the five-finger maple doesn't come into leaf till quite late in the spring right. so it allows the winter light in and then it creates the shade as you need it when the warmer weather comes on. Fantastic. So it's a very cleverly put together over canopy. Right. Well, this is Acer pentaphyllum, the five finger maple from China. There's apparently less than 200 trees of it in the wild. So it's seriously under threat. And it's a great little tree because it's light and airy and it doesn't come into leaf until well into the spring. So it comes into leaf almost mid spring. So it's still quite bare. And we're in October now, which is well into spring for Australia. I mean, it's halfway through. It's still a bare stick much to the surprise of new owners, I have to say, because they, they often come to me and say, I think my tree's dead. And of course, the idea of having a tree that doesn't come into leaf till late seems to most people to be a weird thing to aspire towards. But because it doesn't come into leaf, it means that it allows lots of light in so that the ephemerals and bulbs and perennials and things that are underneath it can soak up as much spring sunlight as possible uh, before they go into semi-dormancy and this tree comes out into leaf. And for those who are interested, uh, we did do a video in Melbourne Botanic Gardens, which we'll link below, uh, about this particular tree. It was one of the featured plants that we had in one of our videos. And so you'll be able to see the foliage and the seeds on it uh, in high summer. Okay, so we've done our upper canopy. Yes, which includes these silver birches. Yes, which is uh, a classic tree. Yes, definitely a classic tree. Good amount of light. So you've mm -hmm. got that lovely dappled light, which yep. is really important. They've got a vertical habit. They shed quite early, they allow light in right through the winter mm. and of course they give structure to the garden during the mm. winter months because of their attractive trunks. So yes. even when a lot of the bulbs and everything are down, mm. the birches will still be making an impact in yeah. this particular garden. And I guess in terms of the canopy tree then, there are many different things you could find that are maybe um, late to leaf or fine leaf, so there are other alternatives than oh, these too. Undoubtedly, it's just a matter of selecting something appropriate to your climate yeah. that has the uh, characteristics that you're looking for. 
Okay, so we've done the upper canopy. Now, what are we doing at the mid-level? All right, well, there's a couple of major plants that have been used uh, in this garden to yeah. give that sort of mid-level. And probably the most interest or the most important would be the Japanese maples. And Kathy's yes. used a number of different ones. We've got a lovely fine-leafed burgundy one over here, yes. uh, which is lovely. And there's a nice a bright green one down on the left-hand side here, at least my left-hand side. So there's a range of maples in the garden. Now, they give good good summer foliage. Uh, so when your perennials are down, you've still got good summer foliage. And of course, your birches will just go a soft yellow, but your maples will go bright oranges and reds. And so they'll give you a great autumnal effect mm. in the garden. Mm. So when, you, when your maples turn, your other plants will be dying down. Yep. And so it just gives you something interesting all year round because you don't want to have an area like this that looks fabulous for three weeks mm. and then you've got nothing to look at the rest of the time. We'll get to that because I feel that becomes a problem at ground level. Yeah, well, yes, there will be issues at ground level, but I think Kathy's covered that quite well. But Stephen, is there not something else? Yes, there is indeed. And right behind me here is one of the giant tree angelicas from Madeira, which used to be called Melanosolinum discipiens. It's had a name change yet again, and it's now called Dorcas discipiens, which means it's in the same genus as the humble carrot. The humble carrot is a giant carrot. Yeah. And is this not a monocarp? Yes, it will die after flowering. Ta-da! I remember that because we have made a video about monocarps. We did which included indeed. that plant, so I will link that below. All right. Now, the, the thing about the Dorcas mm -hmm. is that being evergreen mm -hmm. uh, for as long as it lives <laughs> yeah. and with bold foliage, again, it becomes part of the whole scenario in the growing season. Yeah. But in the winter, when a lot of the other things are down, it becomes a dominant foliage plant. Yes. So your trees are bare, you've got the trunks of your birches, your maples have, have dropped all their leaves. Mm. Then the Dorcas will come into their own as, the, as a major feature actually through the winter months. So it's good in terms of them planning your own um, woodland walk, as this is, or woodland garden, is to try and find an evergreen perennial. Yes, you did, or, you, or an evergreen mm, plant yes. of some sort that will fit into the thing. Mm. And certainly in the not too colder climates, the Dorcas seems to work rather well. And it can work in lots of different ways. I mean, I use it in tropical borders yes. uh, because it looks really quite tropical and palm-like. Yeah, it, it is a, an extraordinary, and it's massive too. Yeah, yeah so it's a really interesting and, and weird plant. Yeah. Not the first thing that would come into people's minds, I guess, if they're putting together a woodland walk. Mm. But in Kathy's garden, it has worked exceedingly exceedingly well. Mm. So I would certainly recommend it to others. Yes. All right. Well, let's go further down the border and look at what is at ground level. Yes, because there's lots going on down there. There is. Uh, Stephen, I think one of the things about this space is it's not big and it's not very long and we'll get to the dimensions in a minute, but there is so much going on and you yep. literally stop at every step to take in a little moment of beauty. So take us through what's happening at the ground level and I will drop in all the shots of the things we're talking about. All right. Well, I have to say that's part of the fun of it, of course, because yep. it's so intricate. Yeah. It makes you walk slowly because you're looking at everything as you go. Which is so, exactly what I did. Yeah. <laughs> and the space then seems larger. Yes. Or at least longer. Yes. You know? So if you if the journey takes a fair while, mm due to the fact you have to stop at everything as you go along, mm. then it gives you that sense of it being a much grander area than it is. And Kathy's used a really interesting mixture of self-seeding annuals and biennials, yep. perennials, bulbs, mm. evergreen um, ferns, a whole range of different things within this garden mm. that create that tapestry. So we'll run you through a few of my favourites. Yes. One of them would have to be Honesty, and we did talk about Honesty or Linaria annua. Honesty is always very important. Yes, well, and in the case of that plant, it's, it's a lie because it's called Linaria annua, and yet it's a biennial. So uh, <laughs> it's a deceitful plant. Yeah, it definitely is. And Kathy's got both white and mauve uh, honesty in the garden here. Mm. And she's obviously allowing it to self-seed and then just culls wherever there's plants coming up where she doesn't want them. And I must say, the position of them is perfect. Yeah. It's like the perfect scale, the perfect mm. counterbalance to the other lime green things going on in front. Well, that's the thing too. It's a matter of managing these plants so they don't become dominant, but yeah. become a, an important feature. Yeah. And the plant that could easily dominate if it was allowed to do mm. so uh, is the limey yellow plant that is all through these borders, mm. uh, which is one of the Alexander's, Smyrnium perfoliata. Mm -hmm. And it's a 
basically a triennial. Mm. So it comes up, grows for two years and then flowers and dies. Mm. Uh, and it will self-seed itself like there's no tomorrow. Mm. But it's limey green flowers in drift through a woodland garden yes, is just sublime. It is. Beautiful, beautiful plant. Yeah. So Smyrnium. And then, of course, kathy has got one of my all-time favourite woodlanders growing well here. Mm. And that's the Trilliums. Yes. And she's got both white ones and burgundy ones in the garden here. Mm. They look to me probably all forms of chloropetalum. The white one might be albedum. But anyhow, they're the big leaf trilliums with the beautiful upright flowers on them. Mm. And they make big, solid, chunky clumps. So they've yes. obviously been in the garden for quite some time. Yep. And they make wonderful spring impact. And we've made a video about trilliums because it is quite a sort of a it's a process in terms of their life yep. cycle, so we'll link that. Yes, you need to have a look at them as a whole. And the other group of plants that I think, or at least one of the other groups of plants that I think is really, really interesting, mm. and that Kathy has used well here, are the epimediums, yes. uh, the barren warts, which are a wonderful group of woodlanders. They are. Now, here's the thing, that early in our horticultural career together, yeah. I was never that enthused. People get quite obsessed by them. Oh yes. But the more I see the variety and the more, I mean, in just Kathy's small bit here, yeah. there's so many variety of leaf form, of leaf color, of flower, flower color. Yeah. They are quite incredible. So what is their life cycle? Are they evergreen or is it herbaceous? Well, that's the other good, interesting thing about epimediums, that a good percentage of them are evergreen. Mm. So they will give you good foliage right through the summer, yes. autumn, winter. Yes. They're pretty well all spring flowering, so they're out in flower now. Yeah. But they will give contrast to foliage and form right through the year. Some of them even will get coloured foliage in the winter, although they are sort of semi-herbaceous. Mm. They don't die down till the new leaves start coming up. Yep. And if they get enough cold on them, they'll often go burgundies or orangey browns or mm. all sorts of interesting colours. So epimediums will hold a border together really, really well, yeah. uh, much longer than a lot of the ephemerals will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get the benefit of the flowers when they flower, but the, the foliage oh, most yeah. times. And it varies. Uh, there's some here with really spiky, almost yeah. holly-like leaves, yeah. heart-shaped leaves. There's a whole range of different foliages. Mm. And some of them also have blotched, speckled, and interesting new growth when it comes up. So mm. epimediums are probably not one of those plants, well, like you, you didn't get excited to start with, but it takes time to learn the appreciation yes. about that group of plants. To mature and develop yes. once Yeah, as a horticulturalist, yes. yes, exactly. Now, there is something else that I wondered about, the, what looks like a little wild strawberry ah. that's kind of creating a, almost like a ground cover mat in places. And again, it's one of those plants that's evergreen. Yeah. It's Potentilla indica, mm. uh, and it looks like a yellow flowered wild strawberry, basically. Yes. Are they related? And, you know, distantly and of course again it's evergreen mm. so although kathy has got snowdrops and all sorts of other things that come out here earlier in the season mm. they never come out in bare ground because mm. you've got the strawberries you've got the epimediums you've got sweet woodruff the gallium there's lots of evergreenness here yeah and of course hellebores yes. winter flowering evergreen foliage so great presence in a garden and we they're to here have too. an epic hellebore video too which we'll link I think people are going to spend the rest of their lives going back to our back catalogue of yeah. videos where we're going with this woodland walk. Now, the other thing that we have made many a video about, which I can see here, are euphorbia. Yes, and Kathy's used euphorbia amygdaloides robii. Mm. Miss Rob's bonnet is its common name. Yeah. And it's a suckering, shade-loving euphorbia, which is not that common. I was going to say, not common, because yeah. they generally like full sun. Yeah, so this one grows very well in the shade, and it drifts, so you end up with lovely drifts of it through the garden. Yeah. Again, it can be a bit of a thug. It might need a little bit of management in some people's gardens, mm. but with its limey green heads and its dark green foliage, its evergreenness, because you cut it back after flowering, and then the new growth comes up, mm. so it's basically evergreen. Yeah. Uh, so again, it ties the border together year-round. Now, another thing I've noticed that we've covered before in your garden is that white flowered ground ah, cover plant again. Yes. What's that? Yes, uh, Pachyphragma macrophylla, mm. which is in the cabbage family, gets round heart shaped leaves. In fact, it looks like and is comparatively closely related to wasabi. Oh, so, actually, you can see that. Yeah, 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 and it has lovely white flowers in the spring. Mm. And although it recedes a bit in the winter, it never disappears. So yes. again, it always has a presence. So I was going to say, one of the, the big issues, I think, with a garden like this or a walk like this is succession. Oh, yeah. So we've actually dealt 
a lot with what's happening. Spring's easy, yeah. but we've got a lot of winter stuff going oh, on. Oh, yeah. Here. Yeah, and it, which includes, of course, I guess, late winter with your snowdrops and other bulbous things coming mm. up. But there's plenty of things going on year round. Mm. So this would be a woodland walk that you could walk any day of the year and actually engage with something happening the whole time. Mm. So it's not one of those areas that you go into just once in the year and go, yeah. oh, isn't that pretty, and then walk away from yeah. it. This would be a walk that if it was in my garden, I would walk it almost every day. So would I. Mm. So there's also Erythroniums here, yep. which we made a beautiful video with with uh, Jane Tonkin in yep. the oh, Erythronium yes. field, which yep. is beautiful. But I want to ask you, what is this tall thing? Here? Ah, yeah. Now, this is another plant that will give you year-round interest, mm. and it's a sort of Solomon seal type thing, mm. but it's basically evergreen, and it's quite tall. It can get up to two metres tall, mm. and it's a disporum. Not quite sure which disporum disporum that one is some of them are quite similar yeah. but it looks like disporum longi styla in one of its forms and they get little yellow bell-like flowers on the new stems that come up normally when the new stems are well underway I have all the old stems cut off because they start to get tatty looking yeah. so you take them off as the new ones come so up. So these are the ones with the berries are the old ones? Yeah that's the old ones there mm. and you've got the nice new one coming up with the flower buds just forming in the top of it yeah. looking rather sort of almost asparagus like the way yes, it comes up yes. and disporums are one of those sort of obscure group of woodland plants that have suddenly come out on uh, horticulturally of the uh, closet. out of the closet yes <laughs> out of the horticultural closet yeah they, they've suddenly become oh wow why mm. didn't we know about that plant mm. so there's a an oodle of, of disporums some of which are completely herbaceous but there's a many of them that don't have their old foliage die down before the new foliage comes up so they could be classed basically as evergreen. Now right next to it is a smaller plant with a pendulous yellow ah, bellflower. Yes one of my favorites now it's one of the sort of things you'd have in your woodland that you have to go hunting for. Well you, this is a little hidden. Yeah it is a little hidden in there but that's the charm of these that stops you in your tracks yes. and you have to look around mm. and it's a little plant from North America that's commonly known there as Merry Bells mm. which is quite a quaint and pretty name. Its botanical name on the other hand isn't probably quite so good. Uh, it's called Uvularia grandiflora. Is this your... Yeah, yeah, that thing that hangs down the back of your oh, throat oh, is your okay. uvula, that piece of skin <laughs> that hangs down there. So whatever taxonomist named this plant was obviously having a bad day. Or when had you tonsillitis. Or yeah, something. he might have had tonsillitis. So yes, it's been named after the piece of skin that hangs down the back of your throat. So Shiny. Uvularia grandiflora. I'll stick with Merry Bells for that one. I think it's a much nicer name. Mm. And it's just a lovely little quaint quite ephemeral plant. It will come up, flower, the leaves will stay there for quite a while and then go yellow and it will die down, but it's not there all the time. So it's one of those spring ephemerals. All right. Well, I think we've covered, not everything, but a lot oh, of yes. the lower to the ground plants. But there is something over there I want to ask you about, because that then links to climate and aspect. So let's go and look yeah. at that. All right. Well, I've walked up and down this woodland walk today about four or five times and hadn't even noticed this little gem. This is Malisferula graminea, and it's in the Iridaceae family, so it's related to Ixias and Sparaxis and all those sorts of things. South African in origin, and it's a little tiny bulb that can in fact become quite weedy in some particular climates, so beware. But here in Kathy's little woodland walk, it's just become a lovely component of the walk. Doesn't seem to be making any takeover bids, although it is self-seeding itself lightly. And it's a pretty little flower that I might add picks quite well. So if you're looking for something to cut for the house, you could do far worse than having some Malus Ferula in the garden. I have to say I'm a little bit surprised that it's doing so well here because being a South African bulb, you often associate them with much hotter, drier sort of conditions, but it seems to be perfectly happy in here and that may in fact be part of the reason why it's not actually becoming uh, invasive at all. It's just sort of filling little gaps in amongst other things. Now, Stephen, it's a very yeah. narrow path, but yes, it is. the thing I wanted to ask you about was this, which to my eye looks a little bamboo-y. Is it a grass? What is it? I know it's variegated, so I'm it, recoiling. Yes, of course you are. It is, in fact, a bamboo. It's one of the Pleoblastus, oh. uh, and they're a semi-dwarf running bamboo, mm -hmm. which is being controlled to a certain extent by being grown in amongst the roots of the birch tree, yeah. which will sort of hold it back a bit. Yeah. But it will need a little bit of occasional maintenance so that it doesn't take off and take over too much space. Yeah. But the variegation would work really well in the winter against the white trunk of the birch, the silver variegation of the bamboo. 
I see it as you know quite a tasteful way of adding interest, particularly in the winter. Mm. In the summer months or in the spring, particularly when everything else is going mad, it probably doesn't actually stand out as much. But at certain times of the year, it would become a really important visual asset. So two things though. Firstly, it's spring and I think it looks really beautiful with the lime green, yes. the birch trunk and right now. So it, it stands out beautifully. But I thought bamboo was always a sun lover. This no. is quite shady. Yeah, well, quite a number of the, um, particularly the Asian running bamboos, mm. uh, are actually woodlanders. Ah. So the sasses, the pleoblastuses and things, um, all tend to be um, quite happy in semi-shade to shade. Uh, some of them will grow happily enough out in full sun as well, mm. but they can be quite useful in the shade. How so interesting. There you go. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about climates. All right, what a good idea. So Stephen, let's just contextualize where this is. So it's on the south side of the house. Obviously we're in the southern, southern hemisphere, hemisphere. Yep. which means it is the shadiest yes. location. So in the northern hemisphere, it will be the north side of the exactly. house. Exactly, yeah. So it is the cooler side of the house. Mm. The house is there to protect it from the hot afternoon sun and the hot winds. Mm. So it is a nice sheltered, cool little environment. Yes, which I guess brings me to another point, which is, you, well, how would we describe the climate here? It's hard, isn't it? Because you could say it's warm temperate or wet Mediterranean or... Yeah, look, it, it, it does fall between stools slightly, mm. but we do get quite hot, dry summers. We are generally winter, spring rainfall oriented, mm. and the temperature rarely goes more than a degree or two below freezing, so we don't get a serious cold winter. Mm. We might get an occasional smattering of snow, but that's very rare. Yeah. Uh, so that probably gives people a sense of the climate mm. to a large extent. We don't have the same zonal systems as you do in the States. So I guess this leads me to the question, this is the type of garden you imagine in Britain or in parts of yeah. North America, like in the Northeast coast. And obviously somewhere like Macedon, Mount Macedon, where it's cooler and wetter. If you were in a drier climate, more Mediterranean, yeah. could you do a version of a woodland garden? Yes, you could. You'd use probably a comparatively different palette of plants. Yeah. Uh, although some of the things Kathy has used here could translate into a warmer, drier uh, environment. Mm. But yes, you just have to find the appropriate plants. I mean, once you get into really dry climates, you might be pushing it to find mm. interesting plants to do it. Mm. And some of your more delicate ephemerals probably wouldn't manage. Mm. Uh, but there's going to be plants that would cope quite well and, and you could create your own version of this woodland garden. Yeah, and it's about the length of Kathy's house. How long would you, what? What scale would you say this is? All right, well, the whole length of the border would be 40, 50 feet long, mm -hmm. I suppose. And at its narrowest point, it would only be about 10 feet wide, but it does widen out uh, substantially at the top. It would probably mm. be 15 to 20 feet wide at the mm. top end. So it's sort of a, a long, narrow triangle. But also it kind of, in terms of its general width and length, not unlike a driveway. No, in fact, if there wasn't a whole pile of plants there, you could drive your car up Yeah, here. there you go. So that gives you a bit of a sense of scale. It's not massive, but your point was so interesting mm. that because there are so many things, and in some cases only one of mm. something, that you do stop and you yeah. think, oh, I'm on like a, an hour walk through the wood. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And in fact, I could take as long on an hour walk through the woods as I can take in Kathy's garden as I stop to look at, photograph and enjoy whatever's here. Smell the roses. Yep. metaphorically, because there aren't any. But anyway, this has been so beautiful and what a delight to stumble across it, two houses down from you. Oh, well, see, you know, horticulturalists sort of stick together. <laughs> they do, they do. Well, many thanks, Cathy, for letting us into your garden this morning. It's been very generous of you. And we've had a wonderful time and I hope other people enjoy this garden as much as I do. Yes, well, they can't because it's not open to the public. No, it's not, so there you go. <laughs> but you can enjoy it on our video. You can indeed. But anyway, if you want to know what we're doing next week, you'll have to hit subscribe. And don't forget that if you put in a comment below, I can answer your questions on our Monday shorts. Yes, otherwise join us next Friday for our continuing journey through the horticultural woodland paths. And we look forward to seeing you then. Bye all.